The Affair. If the narcissist was honest. This video explores an interaction between a shelf intimate partner secondary source or an intimate partner secondary source that's a dirty little secret. The individual is having an affair with a narcissist who is married. The narcissist is married to an IPPS, naturally, who is in devaluation. This video describes the dynamic and also explains more about the thought process and viewpoint of the narcissist towards that appliance that is having an affair with the narcissist. If the lesser or mid-range narcissist had awareness, this is what they would be conveying. And if the greater or the ultra chose to convey their awareness to you, these are some of the things that would be said. This is to help you understand where you might be in that position of being the other woman or other man and having an affair with a married narcissist as to how they actually regard you. Utilize it as a wake-up call. You think about me every day. I want that. I think about you thinking about me, and that gives me some thought fuel. It also allows me to understand that you are under my control, because I have to have you under control, like everybody else that I deal with. I know that you wait for those teasing and tempting text messages, which come through repeatedly during the day. I love the text messages. I can keep control of you pretty easily with them, throwing you these little bon mots of delight and supposed love, which you eat up with great eagerness, always replying within the instant. I picture you sat there, just waiting for the chime of the phone, the beep of your phone, so that you know that the message has come from me and you stop whatever you're doing. You stop showering, you step out of the shower, you stop eating, you might even be texting whilst you're driving, in order to reply to me. I pepper you with them all through the day, as I control you and your responses tell me that you're under control, and I gain fuel from you. Of course, they then dry up around 6pm, because that's when I go home to the IPPS. Once in a while, you might get a sudden text at, say, 9pm, telling you that she's popped in the bath, and that I love you. Of course I don't. I'm a narcissist, and I'm incapable of love. But I tell you that, because it's an excellent way of asserting control over you. And, of course, where I'm an unaware narcissist, I actually do believe that I love you, but I'm incapable of it, because I have no emotional empathy. I use that opportunity, you see, because I compartmentalise. The bath that she's in, the IPPS, I've given her a respite period. So, I drew the bath for her, I lit some candles. Of course, I won't tell you that, unless, of course, I want to make you jealous and triangulate with her. But often, I will do something nice for that person... And because I compartmentalise, I close the door on that interaction and open the door on one with you. And I don't see anything wrong with that. My narcissism stops me from seeing anything wrong. The hypocrisy of being nice to her and then speaking to you and then smearing my IPPS to you. I send you these messages telling you that I love you, that I miss you and I hate being apart from you. All good to keep you under control. Also, because I've got one mind on ensuring that the IPPS is controlled, that I warn you against replying, and therefore all you can do is touch the glowing screen and try to feel the sentiment behind those electronic messages of desire. Look at how I control you. I send you a message giving you that thrill at 9pm, another little burst of the interaction between you and I, and I immediately then tell you that you can't reply because I have to keep you under control and ensure that you don't threaten my control over the IPPS, even though they're in devaluation. I know how you cherish that period around 5.30pm, every day when we speak on the telephone, just you and I. More control and more fuel. I'm driving home from the office, and I use that half hour or so to regale you with my compliments and to issue those promises, oh, all the future faking, that perhaps one day I'll be driving home to you. I've created this period as a little oasis between us, and I know it because you told me that you come out of meetings, that you alter your day, to always ensure that you're available at that time. And you sit there waiting, perhaps pulled over in your car, sometimes at home, 
phone in hand, waiting for that call of when I've got into my car and when I'm driving home. Whatever you are doing, you always ensure that you are available and your phone line is free in order to engage in this call. You now arrange social engagements to take place later, or you remain at your office, ensconced there, appearing to be engaged in a business call, save, of course, that you smile far too much for something that is work-related. That half an hour of heaven, when we talk as if we were properly together, making plans, discussing the things we like and dislike as I mirror you, planning the next time we can snatch some time to make love without being detected, or laughing about what was discussed when we met for lunch earlier. I draw the fuel from you, and I control you. You manage to arrange to have lunch with me at least once a week. We deliberately choose a place that is neither likely that neither is likely to be recognised in, and we place ourselves around the corner and out of sight, hands held beneath the table and then removed when the waiter nears us, just in case. Stolen kisses, lingering lucks and promises. Oh, so many promises of the wonderful world that awaits us once I manage to free myself of the chains of my marriage, if, of course, I ever decide to do so. You listen carefully and attentively, showing the empathy for which you were chosen as I make oblique references to my miserable home life. Each time you gently press for more information to enable you to understand what it is that I have to endure. What it is that I have had to put up with and what it is that has driven me into your arms. I try not to say too much at first. I don't want our oh two brief times together to be spoiled by my tale of woe, although there are some of my kind that will give you the full pity play, indeed the sympathy symphony, about how terrible the home life is. But invariably I tell you plenty because your sympathetic ear proves irresistible and it is important for me to assert control over my IPPS by smearing her to you and you being sympathetic and by controlling you by making you think that there is a, a chance that you might become the IPPS. I will tell you things such as we, do, we just do not get on any longer. That's actually a lie. We get on fine when we are together but I believe that in this moment in order to smear her and to control you. She lost interest in me sexually three years ago. I'm amazed I've lasted this long. Nothing I seem to do is good enough. No matter how hard I try, she always finds something to criticise. No, we're more like brother and sister. We don't have sex anymore. She thinks my clothes are painted on. Little do you know, I was banging her brains out last night. Why? I'm entitled to. And of course, because I'm compartmentalising. When I give her a respite period and take her to bed, I control the wife and gain fuel from her. And then I see you the very next day. I have no conscience, no guilt or remorse to prevent me from feeling bad, to make me feel bad rather about what has happened. In fact, it is put from my mind what I did the night before, because I am operating moment by moment. You see, if I met you and said, Hi, my wife is beautiful. She looks after herself, exercises well and eats healthily. She's a really good laugh, hilarious when she's had a few drinks fantastic mother, brilliant in the bedroom, fantastic in the kitchen, very entertaining, holds down a good job, and is intellectually stimulated, do you fancy fucking me? You'd look at me like I was a nutcase and refuse. So in order to draw you in, I have to tell you lots of lies, although of course my narcissism makes me believe them, where I'm lesser or mid-range, or if I'm greater or ultra, I know that I'm lying, but I just don't care. I will have the best of both worlds either way. When I tell you sometimes to triangulate you that I have sex with my wife, but it's only you that I think of, that's a load of bollocks. You're not even in my head. She is, because I'm controlling her. At that point, you've been shelved, and I'm not thinking about you. But of course, I need to control you when I'm with you, so, I, so if you ask, do you still have sex with your wife, I give you the appearance of honesty by telling you, yes, I do. But then, because I can see from your reaction that that your threatening control because you don't like what I've said, I have to soothe and placate you by telling you, oh, but it's you that I think of. It's a lie. But if I'm lesser or mid-range in that moment, I believe it. And if I'm a greater or ultra, I know that it's hogwash, but I simply do not care. So I tell you all about my particularly troubled home life, and a lot of the time it's a fabrication. And in some instances, where there are things to complain of, 
It's only actually because of the way that I've treated my intimate partner primary source and she's had enough. But I would never admit to that because my narcissism won't let me, either by meaning that I'm not aware of it, or if I am, I can't admit that because that would be a transference of power, and that's not allowed. As I explain all of this to you, you listen and nod. I know you're desperate to weigh in and slide a knife between me and her and cut our bonds, but the decency that you're imbued with prevents you from doing so. You even suggest reasons why this state of affairs is as it is. You are kind, generous and understanding. You're an empath, and that's why I chose you. You thrill to my sudden calls out of the blue. You always answer after one ring, sometimes even less, thus denoting that your phone is kept next to you at all times. That tells me you are under my control. Your voice also signals to me how delighted you are to hear from me. I gain fuel from that. When we meet, your eyes, your kiss, your hugs and your spoken enthusiasm cause me to soar as I witness your devotion and desire, and you fuel me. You experience a surge of excitement when you are disturbed by a chime in the middle of the night and see that I have somehow managed to issue another text to you. I might write, I cannot get you out of my head and had to let you know. Don't reply. I am in bed with her. I gain thought fuel from imagining you're delighted receiving this text at 2am and I know that you'll have been woken up by it and I know that you'll be lying there in the dark cradling the phone thinking of me and that, just for an instance, gives me that surge of power. The delight that you experience at hearing from me when you expected not to is tempered by the knowledge that I am with her and not you. The weekends are harshest as you often tell me I can tell you you want to say more, but I know that you are fearful of pushing me away by being too demanding. And you're right to, because if you do start to place too many demands upon me, you will threaten my control, and therefore I will shelf you, and possibly with a corrective devaluation. I text you when I can, and sometimes I even manage to call you speaking in hushed tones from a toilet cubicle or a changing room in a department store, stifling my laugh that I pretended to try on some clothes just so I can tell you, because I'm also pleased at how clever I am. I keep you hooked, though. I know how much you want me. I know you love me, and I know you want me to be loved, to take me away from the misery of my marriage because you want to save me. I promise you that one day we will be together, more future faking. But now is not the time. It's not quite right at the moment. There's a family event coming up, and it wouldn't be sensible to drop such a bombshell with that on the horizon. Excuses, excuses, excuses. There's a family holiday that she has booked. I didn't even know about it until now. Another lie, we booked it together. But what can I do? I will have to go. I keep the promises coming and the excuses flowing, and still you hang on. Such is my control over you. I know you wonder why I keep my phone close to me. You haven't said anything yet, but I'm not stupid. I can see the suspicion in your eyes when I wake and immediately check my mobile. I am waiting for an important email that may have come in from the States overnight, I explain, an issue of disarming. Smile. You nod. You seem to accept the explanation. This is what I explain to my intimate partner primary source. She is suspicious of me. She thinks that there's something going on but I maintain a plausible deniability. She complains how she's never able to get me on my phone when she rings because I'm talking to you when I'm on my way home. She's left me repeated messages asking me to pick up some milk or to collect one of our children from the swimming or the football pool or the football only for me to pick up the message too late. Of course, I'm so self-absorbed exercising my sense of entitlement by drinking the fuel of you and devaluing my family that it doesn't concern me that I fail to do these things. I fob it off by explaining that I need to be available for my clients. I explain that my clients don't know that I'm driving home and that they don't care. They need to speak to me. After all, I explain to my IPPS, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have all of this, I say, pleasantly sweeping an expansive arm at the large house and expensive furnishings all around. I assert control over her as a consequence of her wondering why she can never speak to me at that particular time. The IPPS will nod in acceptance. She understands that my work is important. That's because I tell her often enough that it is.
She does complain. She says, I wish you would meet me for lunch when I come into town. I kiss her forehead and tell her that I wish that I had the time to enjoy lunch with the woman that I love, but it's a sandwich and a bottle of fizzy water at my desk for me, always the hard work, there are targets to hit. Of course, I'm having lunch with you and not her. But I need to ensure that she doesn't cause me too many problems because she has to be kept under control. And I continue to tell her that I love her because in that moment, I believe it if I'm lesser or mid-range. Where I'm greater or ultra, I do not. But again, I don't care. My IPPS nods in understanding when I explain this to her and demonstrating her empathic traits tells me that I work too hard. As she is saying this to me, my mind drifts as I think about you, my dirty little secret, and wondering what I'll eat in the Thai restaurant when I'll be meeting you for lunch tomorrow there. After I've made love, as it's apparently called to my wife, she will comment, I wish they would leave you alone. As I turn away in bed from her, after having made love to her, I can feel her hand lingering on my back, wanting to maintain the closeness and the connection, as I attend to my phone on the nightstand and issue a late night text to you before placing it face down. See how I compartmentalise? In the matter of seconds, I move from being inside her to then texting you. And then I'm back to her. I know, I say, apparently seeming empathetic, empathetic, but it saves waking up to a problem. And then, having sent you a text saying that I miss you and I'm thinking of you, I return to my wife and kiss her as we nestle in our marital bed. Compartmentalise, compartmentalise, compartmentalise. I know that she cherishes our weekends together when the demands of the working week intrude less onto the domestic life, I sense at times her looking at me as I'm texting you, my phone in hand, that smile of contentment from the fuel playing across my lips, but nowhere near as wide as the smile inside of me as I fire off a tempting and teasing message to you, to make arrangements, to meet you, to control you, to gain fuel from you. And as I send that text to you, continuing the affair, I turn to my wife and say, just seeing if Dan is available for squash next week, Tuesday night, so I'll be back late. I provide this explanation, creating a gap in the week for someone other than Dan, for someone other than my wife. She smiles and nods and returns to her buck. I then turn and decide, in order to assert control, because she's painted white, because she's not threatening my control and accepting what I'm saying, that I say, I love you. My wife looks up, and the devotion and desire burning in her eyes seems so familiar, almost making me say something. I see you, I see her. I do not really distinguish between the two of you. You are all appliances to me. The thought passes, and I allow myself to wallow in the admiration and love that my wife sends towards me, just as a text comes back from you. Fuel lines. Always the fuel. My wife doesn't know about you. She thinks she knows all about you. The point is that you, as my dirty little secret, and her, as my intimate partner primary source, neither of you really know what I am. I am the narcissist. And I am controlling both of you attending to my need for the prime aims, manipulating both, manipulating both of you, lying to both of you, and caring not that I do so, or, where I am an unaware narcissist, not even realise that I am doing so, moving from one to the other, with ease, moving from compartment to compartment. Always the control, always the fuel. This is what I do. And you, as that dirty little secret or that intimate partner secondary source, the fact is, I will keep you hanging on, playing you along, stringing you along for as long as I need to do. And one day I may make you the primary source. Who knows? I'm not thinking about that right now. But for now, you suit me just where you are, popped on that shelf, taken off when I need you, hoovered in, and then placed back upon it. And you rarely complain, and you rarely grumble, 
and you suck it all up. And that's the way that you should, because you should not threaten my control. You should be a good little appliance and stay on that shelf. That is your role when you have an affair with me, the narcissist. <laughs>